There we go. All right. So, you know, this is something that I shared with my CISP 310 class last night. And I think, you know, it might be helpful in this class. I'm not sure. You know, it's just, you know, using chat and GPT to look up what is the Cornell note taking technique or system. Um, if you have not, um, if you don't know what is the Cornell note taking you know, system, you know, you can look it up. Um, it's very graphical. Um, I talked to the dean this just this morning. You know, she used to teach English writing and uh, and she had the same opinion about you know how Cornell note is helpful because you know it is physically structured which reminds people to not only take note during class but also you know it leaves space for reviewing notes and then making further connections you know as people review their notes that they took during the class so this is a potentially useful resource I mean for those of you who uh, want to look into it? You know, it's a it's a good starting point. Okay, you know, that's what that's the way I look at it. Is it's a good starting point. Um, note taking is, I would say, very important in you know difficult classes. You know, like your cal classes, or I mean, it depends on the individual. I mean, some people think you know. So it's a very graphical approach, and you know, it gives you um, you know a you know each page looks like this. So you are forced to have to think about you know, what you are you know, make taking notes. So this part is what you do during class. This part is what you do after class when you're reviewing your notes. Uh, this part is you know, basically a reminder for yourself to look through this part and this part to come up with some questions. Okay. Because you know, in the process of coming up with questions regarding the material, you are you know that's one of the best ways to study. Okay, because you're you're not trying to memorize everything; you're trying to quiz yourself, and you know that really forces you to have a better understanding of the material. So you know, just some additional resources. You know, because I noticed yesterday in my CISP 310 class that many people did not take notes. Uh, that's one of the advantages of having an in-person lecture followed by an in-person lab, because in the in-person lab, you know, I can see how many people do not remember what I talked about during the lecture, you know, which is, you know, what they need in order to get a lab done. So just, you know, a little bit of resources, you know, for people who are interested. Um, and what we'll be doing today is really just kind of go over the exam two of uh, last semester. Our exam is next Wednesday, one week from today, and we're going to use the entire lecture time for the exam. If you finish early, you can feel free to leave early, or you can stay and just kind of double check your answer. It's up to you. Uh, the time frame is going to be from noon to 1.20 p.m. Uh, for people who need DSPS accommodations, you probably want to get it arranged as soon as possible because DSPS wants to have at least one week of lead time, you know, when you want to use their resources. All right, so none of that is new. Um, we have already been talking about this uh, since last time, and I think I just lost. Oh. Nope, okay, this is not the the right screen because I need to go to the super note screen here. All right, and then maximize this one. There we go. All right, so last Wednesday, I really do not like it when we have, you know, like Monday, you know, off, you know, because you know, we lose basically one half of the lecture time of the week. So last Wednesday, we talked about question number one, and I think we got it all done already, or for the most part done. So I'm going to use my uh, pen here to write down the answer. Um, for the first question, you know, for 15%, if C0 of Rx, R and X, you know, and the cardinality of their result is zero, um, which property is confirmed about R over X, your know, relation R over X? So we looked at, you know, C0 last time, which is from here all the way up to here. And we concluded that that has to do with um, anti-symmetry. But the thing is the set that is returned by C0 is a set of counterexample 
of a relation that is not anti-symmetric, which means if the cardinality is zero, then the relation is anti-symmetric. So what we write down here is um, anti-symmetric or anti-symmetry, you know, either way works. So anti-symmetric is the answer here. And then we looked at C1, and C1 is defined right here. And what really gives C1 away is it involves three variables, because every element in C1 is a three tuple, and it involves your E, F, also G. Of all the properties of relations, only one property requires the mentioning of three variables, and that one is transitive. So the only remaining question is, are we looking for counterexamples or are we looking for the complement of counterexamples? Because you, you kind of have to figure that part out. Um, so in this case, we are looking for counterexamples because we are looking for cases where E relates to F, F relates to G, but E does not relate to G. So that means you know, if that conjunction is true, then we have a counterexample of you know, why a relation is not uh, transitive. So when the cardinality of the set returned by C1 is empty, which means the cardinality is a zero, then it is transitive. So we write transitive here. And then for 20%, you have to apply that to the specific R, the relation, and the specific X in this case. So it's asking in C0 of this particular R and X, what is the result, okay? So we are looking at the relation 2, 0, 2, 1, 0, 0, and 2, 2, defined over X, which has 0, 1, 2 as its elements. And we're asking, do we find counterexamples that relation R is not anti-symmetric? And the answer is no. So that means you know, the answer to question number three is an empty set. Oof. There we go. So this is an empty set. And then we are looking for um, C1 for part four, um, whether this is um, transitive or whether can, can we find counter examples that, so that we can prove that C, uh, R is not an, uh, transitive. And in this case, we cannot find any counter example. So this would be an empty set as well. Do we have any questions right now about this particular question, parts one to four, which is more or less a review from last Wednesday? Yep, go ahead. Well, the way you want to come up with these empty sets is to apply the actual function so basically, you know, in the case of C0, you're looking for cases where e, F, uh, e, R, F, and F, R, E, and, you know, E does not equal to F. And we cannot even satisfy this part here. You know, because when you look at the actual relation, we have 2, 0, but 0, 2 is missing. So the conjunction is not true when, you know, we're looking at 2, 1, or 2, 0, excuse me. And if we look at 2, 1, then we can see that 2, R, 1 is there, but 1, R, 2 is missing. Um, same thing when you're looking at, uh, when you look at 0, 0, it's fine. So if E and F are both zeros, um, well, okay, this wouldn't work anyway, right? Because you know, we are using a set, but it also means you know, this won't work either. Because you, know, you can see 0, 0 is here, 2, 2 is here but neither of these two will satisfy this particular requirement, mostly because of this. So that means here you know, we cannot find a counter example, so the set that is returned by C0 is empty. So, okay, so let's talk about scoring a little bit here. It is entirely possible for, for someone not to answer questions, you know, I mean parts one and two correctly, and be able to score you know, uh, for three and four. Because one and two is trying to relate the functions to the specific properties of a relation. So you have to make that association to get the score for parts one and two. But for parts three and four, it is simply about tell me what it is returning. 
So someone can totally work out you know, part three and four, but not be able to answer parts one and two or the other way around. So I just want to mention that you know, because you know, that's, that's possible. All right, so we're getting to question number five, you know, or part five of the same question, and that's the most complicated part because we want to come up with a tuple TU, okay? TU are just you know, the names of the two variables in the tuple so that when this element is added to R to become S, then we want you know, C0SX to be a one or the cardinality of that set to be a one, and C1 of SX also to be a one. In other words, I am introducing a single two tuple element into what is currently R so that the end result is no longer anti-symmetric and also at the same time, no longer transitive. And I'm looking for those two elements, T and U. So uh, what is S, when S minus R? S minus R is really just you know, the set of the tuple T U, okay? All right, so what do you think? What do we add to R so that it is no longer, at the same time, not anti-symmetric and also not transitive anymore? Okay, so we kind of know that you know, whatever we are introducing is going to be the mirror image of one of these two. So it can be zero, two, it can also be one, two. The question is, which one is the one that we're looking for? You got two candidates. How do you filter down to the one that you want? Well, you can always do the generate and test approach, which means you plug in two, one, or one, two. Okay, so let's say we add one, two to this set here. And do we end up with something that is not anti-symmetric? The answer is yes, okay? Because if one, two is a tuple in the set, then we would be able to find um, two R1 and one R2 and one does not equal to two, okay? Well, that means you know, C0 is going to return a single two tuple um, of either, a, a, not the two tuple, but a set of one, two as its elements. So the question is, would zero, two also work? The answer is yes, two, zero would work for C0, okay? But it's not gonna work for C1 because we want to also break the fact that, we also want to break um, transitive you know, as a property. So if you add um, two, one, two into the relation R, it is not transitive anymore. Why? How do you choose EFG so that there's one single element returned by C1 when you add uh, one, two as a two tuple into R? So two, one, two is not gonna work, right? Because two, two as a, as a tuple is already in the set. But if you choose one, two, one, then it's gonna work. So let me say that one more time. So basically what you're doing is you're saying, okay, what if E is one, F is two, and G is one? So in that case, if one, two is also an element of the relation, then this particular choice of values for E, F, and G is gonna make the rest of this thing true. Because in this case, um, one R two is true because we just added it to the relation. Two R one is true because it's already in the original relation, um, but one R one is missing. And as a result, you have this conjunction here, you know, this part here being true. The rest is just kind of icing on the cake. I mean, the rest is just saying that to make sure that every element is in X, which we already have confirmed. Does that make sense? Yep. Nope, it, it is because in R, in, you're talking about C0? Yeah. So C0 does not return a set of tuples, it returns a set of sets. So one, two, two, one are basically the same set. So that's, <laughs> that's why you have to be very careful about the notation because you know, 
the, the use of curly braces here means we're looking for each element of the set returned by C0 is by itself a set with two elements. Yeah, so that's why you have to be super careful about that. But you're, you make a very good point. If it were parentheses, then yes, it would have a cardinality of two. Yes. Okay. So that means, you know, in this case, the answer is, you know, we introduce one, two, because the question ultimately is asking, what is the difference between S and R? So it's basically asking what new element are we adding to the relation so do we have any questions about parts one, two, three, four, five of question number one? Okay, I don't see any questions. If you do have any questions, you know, later on, you, you can, we can always come back to this one. All right, we move on to question number two, which is about the same format, but don't make any assumption that C0 and C1 are the same between the questions. Okay, nor is you know, R and X defined are the same, so they, are, they can be different. Okay, so in this case, we want to look at C0. Okay, C0 is definitely not the same as anything that we have seen before, so we want to focus on how C0 is defined. All right, so let's check out you know, what it is trying to say. C0 is going to return a set each element of the set is also a set of two elements. Okay, so what is so special about those two elements, E and F? So we are looking for ERF or FRE. In other words, F and E, they need to relate to each other, but the direction, eh, either way is fine, okay? <clears throat> and we are also looking to make sure that uh, one of them is missing. In other words, we are, okay, so I'm not sure whether you guys can see it or not. We are looking to make sure that this, this disjunction is true, but we are also trying to make sure that this disjunction is true as well. Okay. Um, the other ones, you know, which is here, is just making sure that, you know, E is an element of X and F is also an element of X. So it's not, it's a non-issue, okay, because, you know, relate, because R is already a relation, which means, you know, of the two tuples, every single component of each two tuple of R is already an element of X. So we are not too concerned about those two extra requirements. All right, so the first thing you need to do is to look at this and say, okay, I'm just gonna work this out by hand, okay? We look at zero, two, okay? What if E is zero and F is two? Then we go like, okay, you know, um, we do have your know, zero, two here. Oh, come on. Yep, there we go. So we do have that over here. And what about the other one? Two, zero. Well, it's missing. So does that make this disjunction true? The first one. Yep. Does it make the other disjunction true? Yep. Okay. So we find at least one element, you know, that can make, um, so zero, two, as EF is already one single, one particular element. In this case, that's the only element. Because if you plug in uh, one, one, then, you know, because one and one are the same, so that means, you know, if this is true, then this is guaranteed to be false, which means the conjunction is guaranteed to be false. So that means in this case, you know, there's one um, particular element returned by C0. So I can go ahead and write, you know, answer number three first, because I can answer out of order. So in, in this case, you know, for number three, the answer is going to be you know, zero, two in a set. Okay. So if somebody, oh, what is that? I'll just click a button somewhere. Okay. So if anyone is returning, giving an answer, and these are not braces, but instead they are you know, parentheses, I will take points off because they are different concepts. Okay. The concept of a tuple versus the concept of a set they are definitely not the same. Are we good so far? Okay, so I'm not really sure which property it, it, it corresponds to, but I can tell that, hey, you know, uh, C0 is returning a non-empty set. So we now look at C1, and C1 is something that we have seen already. I think that is 
anti-symmetry. So we can just you know, write that down. Okay, this is anti-symmetric. Okay, and then we look at you know, R is definitely uh, anti-symmetric, which means we do not find any counter examples. So that means you know this is going to be an empty set. So now we go back to question number one or part one of this question, which is okay. So if I cannot find any element, okay, in other words, if C0 is returning an empty set, which of the property is going to be confirmed? So how are you going to work on this? So let's say this is the exam, okay, you have already answered your question number one of the previous page. How are you going to approach this question? I'm going to rule out a few things first, <laughs> okay? Um, I'm going to uh, rule out um, anti-symmetry, okay? Because you know, it's pretty clear it's not anti-symmetric. Because if it were anti-symmetric, then it would have the same answer as part four, okay? So I know it's not anti-symmetry. Uh, we does it look like reflexive to you? How many variables do we need in order to qualify? Okay, usually, okay, how many variables do I need to say, oh, this is, you know, reflexive? Just one. And this one has two. Okay, so if it's not reflexive, if it's not anti-symmetry, and we know transitive requires three variables to say that it is not, um, to, to qualify whether it is or is not uh, transitive, so we can rule that one out too. So what is left? Symmetry. So now, but you don't want to write symmetry right now, you know, down right now. You, you want to test it first, okay? So you look at um, R and you ask, is it symmetric? The answer is it is not symmetric because the you know, symmetry, okay, you have to look up the definition of symmetry, but basically it means, you know, ERF if and only if FRE, okay? If you have one but not the other one, then it is not symmetric. So in this case, it's definitely like that because I can see zero two is here, but two zero is missing. So it is not symmetric. So with some certainty, I can write down symmetric right now, okay? Are we good so far? Does everybody understand the reasoning that I went through? It's unlikely. <laughs> right. But, you know, the actual reasoning to confirm that is really to understand this part here. What does that mean? That means I need ERF or FRE to be true. The disjunction needs to be true. But I also need the not ERF or not FRE to be true at the same time. So that means I'm looking for one but not the other. I cannot be missing both. I cannot have both. I need to have one but not the other. So when you have one but not the other, that means it is not symmetric. So that's the other way to look at this question is you know, look at the meaning, look at the semantic of the expression and use that to make a connection to the meaning of what is what symmetry really means. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so the last part of the question, which is part five, has about the same format as the other one. We want to introduce one more two tuple into the relation and make this new relation S. And we want, in that case, to make C0 return a uh, empty set, because right now it does return a one single element in the set. And then we also want C1 to return a non-empty set after the introduction of a single element. All right, so how do we do this? How do we add one element so that R is symmetric? That's an easy one. We add two zero, very good. So the very same element, if you add it to the relation, will also make the relation not anti-symmetric anymore. Because once you have 0, 2, and 2, 1 in the same relation, then it is not anti-symmetric. And that has to do with how anti-symmetry is defined. 
Is that okay? So to be brief, the answer to this question is a set of one single two tuple, where the element is two zero in the two tuple. But you have to make sure that this is the final notation. If somebody is to miss the pair of braces, I will take points off. If somebody is to miss the parentheses, I will take points off. If somebody is to change the parentheses into braces, I will take points off. I'm not trying to be extra picky, but because those are actually incorrect answers from the perspective of concepts. Yes. So going back to part one of this question, uh -huh. it says that C zero R X is or its cardinality is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's try to plug E and F as 0 and 0, okay, and see what happens. So if you plug in 0 and 0, um, I'm going to use the mouse pointer because it's actually more responsive to the mouse pointer here. So if E and F are both zeros, then yes, this is going to be true, but this is going to be false. And because they're connected by a conjunction, if one side is false, the whole thing is going to be false. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2 will not work. I mean, will not work in the sense that, you know, they do not generate an element in the set. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions about question number two? No questions? Okay. Now, before people start to overdo and overstudy the exam from last semester, let me give these people warnings. This is not, the way I test the concepts about relation is not going to be exactly the same as this one. In other words, I will change things up, okay? It's not going to be the same expressions, it's not going to be the same kind of relation, but it will be testing the same scope of subject matter, okay? So I do, I do want to warn people because you know, it, there is such a thing called um, overlearning, okay? That's an AI term, by the way. So in overlearning, it means you know, uh, the neural net would be able to recognize things, but the scope of recognition is going to be too narrow. It won't be able to recognize things that it should recognize um, because it's too, it has basically tunnel vision. The AI is having tunnel vision that's overtraining. All right, so let's move on to number three, okay? So we're moving on to number three, and the first thing is to look at C0 and C1 and see whether we recognize those things or not. I believe that we have seen both, right? So C0 has to do with um, symmetry, okay? So we say symmetric. Now, I know it is the same because I wrote the questions, okay? But when you are taking the test, just because they look about the same, does not mean they are the same. So you still have to kind of verify things you know, carefully. So I would not suggest people to just kind of take a glance and go like, oh, we got two variables. It has got to be that one. Nope, no, nope, don't make those assumptions, okay? Be careful. Um, and then the next one is transitive because we worked that out earlier already, okay? So now we are looking for the actual return value of C0, we you know, apply to Rx. So in this case, we're looking for symmetry, and it is not symmetric. The counterexample to prove that this is not symmetric is 1, 0, or 0, 1. Either way, it's fine because it is in a set. Are we good so far? All right. And then the next one is asking for a counterexample that this is not uh, transitive, but it is transitive. So that means you know, this is going to return an empty set. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. And then the last one is we want to introduce one new two tuple into the relation so that it is no longer symmetric, but it will be, oh, I take it back, so that it will be symmetric but not transitive anymore. And in this case, that should be relatively easy because there's only one thing that you can actually do to make it transitive by adding something. Now, if I'm asking about you know, what can we remove, you know, yeah, that's a slightly different kind of question, but you know, kind of come back to be the same. But since we're adding something, 
This is the reason why it is not symmetric because one zero is here, but zero one is not. That is the reason why it is not symmetric. So that means the way that we make it symmetric again by adding something is to add one zero, I mean zero one to it. So I'm going to write down zero one. But then I also have to make sure that um, this will make it um, not transitive anymore because it was transitive before, okay, because of part four. So the question is, can I confirm that by adding zero one as a two tuple into the relation that it is no longer transitive? And if so, why is it not transitive anymore? So the question, so the answer is, you basically say, what if E is one, F is zero and G is one. In that case, um, ERF is true, FRG is also true, but ERG is not true because one one is not in the relation. Is that okay so far? Okay. So you have to double check, okay? You know, even though you have a pretty good feeling that, okay, by adding this, we're making it symmetric again, that should be the answer. It's also good to double check to make sure that it is no longer transitive. Are there any questions about questions one, two, and three? So what do you, un what do you need to understand to answer questions one, two, and three in the exam? Because I want to kind of go over not only the question, but also you know, the scope of what you need to study and what you need to focus on. So what do you need to know in order to answer, you know, to answer questions one, two, and also three? Okay, and is the question clear enough as it is? Because some, many people have told me that I have a way of asking questions that makes things sound confusing but chat GPT disagrees. <laughs> In other words, chat GPT does not have a problem understanding my instructions. And I think I know why too. Okay, but getting back to the scope, okay? What do you need to understand? Notations, okay? Notations is very important, okay? What is this notation here? What is this vertical bar doing inside the braces? Okay, so you have to remember it is defining membership of the set that we are generating. What is this symbol? What is this symbol? What is this symbol? What does it mean when we say ERF? Okay, all of those are notations. Okay, you have to understand the notations before you can even start to do anything else. So that's important. Okay, notations. Um, these do not use quantifiers, but you should understand quantifiers too, because you know, that's also a concept that I assume that you already understand you know, by the time we have exam two. What else? The properties of a relation. Okay, so we have reflexive, we have symmetric, anti-symmetric, and transitive, and also comparable. Okay, so those are the five basic ones, and then by a, if a relation is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive, then it's partially ordered. If on top of these three, you add in comparable, then it is totally ordered. Okay, so you know, all of those are in the notes, okay? You, you are allowed to bring in as much material as you want, as long as it is on paper. Okay, so I cannot let people bring in an iPad or you know, other you know, tablet devices, but as long as it is on paper, it can be handwritten, it can be printed, it can be a screenshot from the lecture itself, it's gonna be okay. So you have to remember what you need to bring in order to, so that you can look up things. Typically, this is my personal experience, once I prepare the material, you know, like really pay attention to make sure that I include everything that may be, you know, that may be related to the quiz, I won't need that material anymore because the preparation of the material is quote unquote studying in my case, okay? When I was a college student, the process of thinking about what to bring with me, 
and condensing the notes to a form so that I can quickly look up and find the information that I need. That process alone is enough so that I really don't need whatever I have already prepared. But the process is the important part. It is not so much the end result. The end result is a piece of paper, you know, because when I was a college student, many times they would limit you to only one sheet of paper uh, that you can bring in. So I really have to think about what to put onto that piece of paper. And you might think, oh, that's a really bad limitation because I would like to bring as much stuff as I want to. That can turn against you because you, know, you can think about, oh, I'm just going to print all the modules, okay? Because all the material has to be included in this pile of paper. The question is, do you know where to look up you know, that information? If it's not your own writing, and you may, in, unless you have read that material many times so you know where to find stuff, you may have a hard time finding the relevant information. But if you put together your own notes and go like, okay, this is the super condensed version of what I need, then the process of getting that condensed version is studying. It's going to be beneficial already. At least that is my experience. Your mileage may vary. That phrase is not going to work you know, much more because of the electric vehicle. There's no such thing as mileage anymore. <clears throat> Instead, it is miles per kilowatt. Same idea. All right. So do we have any questions about one, two, and three? Okay. No questions. All right. If there are no questions, we are going to move forward to question number four. So question number four is asking, what is known to be true, okay, is psi, which is our usual convention in class. We use the Greek letter psi to indicate what is known to be true. In this case, it is a particular statement or expression. And I even give you the truth table for that particular one. Um, and I want you to fill in the truth table. In other words, evaluate this expression over all eight rows. So that's a little bit mechanical, but in this process, you might actually be able to figure out the second part too. So I'm going to work this out. Okay. All right. So it is not P, not Q, R, and then negate the entire thing. All right. So, well, we'll just work on each row at a time. So for row, for the first row, you know, the left hand side is going to be true. And then for the right hand side, it's going to be false. So we have true implies false, which means the implication itself is going to be false. And then for the second row, okay, there, there are shortcuts to do this because you know, as long as P is true, then if the conjunction has not P in it, it's going to be false, which also means you know, the negation of the conjunction of the left hand side is going to be true, which means, you know, so for these four rows, okay, from, okay, let me use the mouse pointer here. For these four, we know the left-hand side is going to be true. The question is what happens to the right-hand side of the um, implication? So we look at this one and go like, you know, well, that one is going to be true implies true, so the whole thing is true. And then for this one, because Q is false, it would end up with true implies false. This is going to be false. And then for this one, you know, same deal because Q is still here, so it's going to be false. Does everybody understand what I just did, okay, by hand? But I'm using certain shortcuts. Um, and then for the second half of the um, thing, uh, Q, I mean P, excuse me, P is false, which means not P is going to be true. So I'm going to look for, you know, some additional shortcuts, which is, you know, let's look at not Q. So in this case, your Q is true, which means not Q is going to be false, which means the conjunction here is going to be false, which also means the negation of that conjunction is going to be true. So for these two, I need to carefully evaluate the right-hand side and see whether it is true or not. Um, for the first one, it's going to be false because if R is true, not R is going to be false, which means this entire conjunction is going to be false. Then we end up with true implies false, which means the implication is going to be false. And then for this one, um, let's see, we have Q, P is true, and P is not negated. 
which means the whole thing is going to be false, which also means that we have true implies false, which means this is going to be false too. Um, and then for this one, for these two, um, P is false, so is Q. Okay, so that means you know, not P, not Q is going to be true. Um, then it all depends on R. Um, R is true in this case, so that means you know, in this case, the entire conjunction is true, but since it's negated, the conjunction is false. If the left-hand side of an implication is false, that's the easy one because the implication has to be true. And then for the last one, everything is false, which means you know, this entire conjunction is false. Not false is true, so we have true on the left-hand side of the implication. And then because everything is false, we also have false on the other side, then we end up with true implies false, which means you know, the end result is a false. So yes, this is going to be a little bit mechanical. It takes a little bit of time, you know, but you know, it's not difficult either from the concept perspective because you're just plugging in different values to get to the end result. So given this truth table, derive the C and F corresponding to phi. You can use the Boolean algebra and any reasoning that has been discussed in class, but you must show the steps and reasoning. In other words, you have to tell me how you get to the answer. So if I think in this case, you know, the Boolean algebra way may actually be the faster way, so we'll see. <clears throat> So we'll go ahead and use the Boolean algebra method, which is you know, looking at the negation of not P, not Q, R implies not R, P, Q. Okay. So that is going to be, so the implication becomes the negation of the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So now it becomes not P, not Q, R, or I'm going to change the ordering because I'd like it to be uh, in alphabetical order. So it's going to be P, Q, not R on the right-hand side. Okay, does everybody understand what just happened? I applied the definition of implication. The definition of implication negates the left-hand side and then or the right-hand side of an implication. So the negation of this is double negation which means you know, what is left is just this part here, or the right-hand side, and that's exactly what I ended up with. So at this point, um, I would say doing a FOIL is the quickest and easiest way to do it. It is a little tedious, but it's going to be quick and easy. So you know, basically, you end up with nine things, okay? because we are looking at three on one side, looking at three on the other side, it's, you can look at FOIL as a Cartesian product, sort of, okay? So now we end up with, um, okay, I keep touching certain parts of the screen and pops that screen up, which is super annoying. So we have not P or P, not P or Q, not P or not R, and then we work on Q this time, not Q or Q, not Q or, oh, I missed one P, not Q or not R. And then finally we have R, so we have R or P, R or Q, R or not R. All right. So let me just pause. Does everybody see how I applied distribution to the expression over here? This is the weird distribution that doesn't work in normal algebra, but it does work in Boolean algebra. So are we doing okay so far with this? Yes. Um, it depends on your steps. I mean, you know, if this is your approach, I mean, if you if this is how you derive the answer, you have to do it anyway. So I, I don't think anyone can do this like <laughs> not without writing it down. So you might as well just write it down. You know, if you write down the wrong answer or you, you want to abandon something, just cross it out and put a big arrow to the actual proper answer. All right. So we're going to simplify here a little bit. Okay, this is for this is true. 
and then we have not p or q not p or not r then we have true again then we have p or not q i just wanted you know, kind of keep things in alphabetical order as much as possible not q or not r we have r p or r and then we have q or r and then we have true again the truths would simplify out i mean by the time you get this you can actually just leave it like that because that's c and f already so do we have any questions to get to the first you know, cnf you know, without simplification so the simplification is not required because the question simply asks derive the cnf so as soon as you get to the cnf we're done are we okay so far with this one okay i'm just looking at this and see if i can do more simplifications it's not really required so well we'll just leave it as the one that i derived here which is this is the co correct answer already okay so you can just turn in that one all right so moving on to the last one which is question number five so question number five says you know given that psi is blah blah and in parentheses, it emphasized, do not assume this has anything to do with any other question in this exam. So don't think that this is the answer to question number four, okay? Because some people do that. And now we have phi defined to be this, you know, which is a super easy one to turn into a CNF. Why? Well, okay, you, you don't turn phi into a CNF. What do you need to turn into a CNF in order to apply the uh, resolution not phi exactly so if phi is the negation of a cnf and then you negate that what do you get a cnf yep so that's a super easy one and psi is a cnf already which means in this case in this particular version of question number five there's no derivation needed because you are essentially given the cnfs so the question says you are explicitly allowed to apply absorption, but only when it's applicable. An incorrect application of absorption can cause point deduction. I don't think absorption is going to help in this answer, since you can choose which two disjunction to resolve in resolution. In your answer, clearly show the disjunctions, uh, how the disjunctions are resolved. In other words, for each application of resolution, you need to indicate which two are being used and this is just an example, has nothing to do with the proper answer, just an example of the format of the answer. So the answer is going to be um, not P or R, okay, I'll call this the first one, and then the second one is Q or not R. The third one is going to be not Q or R. The fourth one is going to be P or R. Does everybody understand how I got these four? Yes. Not Q and not R. Oh, right. I forgot the negation. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No? Okay. All right. So out of these four, you know, obviously there are many ways to derive new ones. Um, for instance, between the first and the two, I can end up with a not P or Q, but then I have to remember to mention which two are being used to do this resolution. It would be one and two. And then uh, one and three can also resolve. That becomes not P or not Q. That would be between one and three. And one and four would also resolve. Very nice. And that resolves to just R. That's between one and four. So if you can recognize, you know, ahead of time, okay, just by intuitively looking at this and go like, ah, maybe we can get to the false, okay, then you can kind of, you know, work to that goal, okay, but I am not seeing anything yet, so I'm just going to continue with this approach, 
Um, but I would look at your know, five and six because I want to reduce things to single variables or the negation thereof. So five and six can definitely help me because I can resolve Q out of the entire thing and only remain with not P. So we'll go. If I will go ahead and do that. Okay. So not P is the only thing left if I resolve five and six, which means if I can somehow get to just P, I'm home free. Okay. But it doesn't look like that's going to happen. It's, got, it's not going to happen because out of all the things that we have right now, only one of them has a P in it. So I can resolve P or R with a bunch of other things, but it's not going to give me, it's not going to be able to single out P. Okay, so that means you know, eh, using P to get to false is not going to be, it's not going to work. So now we focus on maybe Q, okay? So we look at Q and say, can we single out either Q by itself or not Q? So we look at this and let me see. Can we single out Q? So, in order to single out Q or not Q, we are looking for two expressions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we can single out um, not R, two and three. With two and three? Okay, let's do that. So we have nine. You'll know, single out uh, two if two with with two and three we single out you know, and we end up with just not R. That's from two and three. Very good. So if you want to use R or not R to get to your contradiction, that means you know, we also need to single out R, which is also possible. Okay, so I'm gonna let you guys look at this and go like, how do we single out R? Oh, one four, it's already done. Okay, excellent. So now we get to false because we just look at seven and nine and we're done. So, but this, okay, if this is the answer, it will only get you part of the points because the question is asking, um, all right, use the following area to show that phi is implied by psi only using C and F resolution and proof by contradiction. So I have already used C and Fs, I have used the resolution, but I have not applied proof by contradiction. In other words, yes, I get to the false, but I have not interpreted what that means. Is that okay? So I have to also mention that you know, since psi and not phi is false or implies false, psi implies phi, which is you know the quickest way to say that you know phi is a theorem of psi. So that would be the perfect answer. All right. And that's it. That's the entire test. Do we have any questions? Yep, so the the way that we look at R and not R is you can look at this as R or false. This is also not R or false, so that means that's how you resolve it to false. Because the variable and the negation of the same variable, quote unquote, annihilates each other when you apply resolution. So what you what is left in this case would be false or false, which is just false. And you can always attach or false to anything that is already a disjunction because false is the identity of disjunction, just like zero is the identity of addition. All right, so any other questions? Yep. Say, say that again? So it's not. It, so it is not an O. Oh, okay. I see. Yo, it does look like phi. Yep. Yep. You you are correct. Yeah. The stroke in a zero to make a zero is not supposed to get through. It's not supposed to extend past the circle. Yeah. 
Okay, that doesn't work. Why is it not working? Sometimes when I want it to work, it doesn't work, and then when I don't want it to work, it works. Okay, so. So I'm going to erase this and then write it again. So a zero is supposed to be this without the bar going through. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so, but good thing we are not even, we are not using that notation of empty set because you can also write empty set as a zero with a bar strike through, yeah. Okay, any other questions other than, you know, my poor choice of you know, how to write zero? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, all right, very good. Are we clear on the scope of this test? Like, you know, what you need to know, what I'm expecting you to know for this test. Okay, very good. All right, well, you know, if you have any additional questions, you know, we can always use Monday as well to answer those questions. This is why I always put the actual exam to be one week after the practice, because this way you kind of know what is going to be tested. You can go home, you know, study over the weekend, and if you encounter something, you go like, I'm not really sure about that concept. You can bring it back on Monday, and then we can talk about it. Yep. I didn't want to say for anyone in the class, um, I don't know if anyone has any like other discourse that they use for this class or anything, but um, I've made a Discord that a lot of people are in that has like a lot text bot uh, tax in there as well. Um, so if you guys want the link to that in case you guys want to study with us or anything, I can provide that to you as well. So if you're interested, you know, I can uh, use the announcement to send the invite to your URL. Oh, yeah. You know, that, and then the whole class can have it. All right. Any other questions? I think studying together can be helpful. But I'm going to say just can be helpful. <laughs> Sometimes it is counterproductive. It depends on who is studying with whom. Um, but in many cases, it is helpful because you know having a conversation with somebody else, you know, is helpful. You know, as long as both parties are contributing to the conversation, and not just ending up complaining about me, you know, how I teach in class. I mean, yes, you can complain about that, but it's not going to help you study. At least me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if there are no questions about this, we're going to go back and talk about Lotto. Because somebody just won the one something, one point something billion dollar jackpot. You guys didn't keep track of it? Okay. So let's, let's do that first. Okay. So we'll, <laughs> we'll do a little update on the Powerball thing. Powerball Lotto. Jack Pot Winner. All right. Numbers drawn, and they've found a person. You know, one person, I, I don't know how many people, but oh, 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 we can do this. We can go to the Powerball um, page, California. I don't think it matters. Uh, there we go. All right. So I, I'm curious how many people won the jackpot. So we'll first you know, check that out, and then that will be a good lead to some additional discussions that we are going to talk about. So let's see, where do I find that? Nope, that's not it. Close, there we go. It's down here somewhere. Mm, price amount is one. Oh, so nobody won. I thought someone won you know, the jackpot. That is not true. Oh, okay. Well, okay. So looking at this table, okay, I'll give you the problem and then we'll, we'll think about how to solve the problem, which is which will end up um, giving me an opportunity to teach the concept that I want to teach. So looking at this table, I want to know approximately how many tickets were sold because the jackpot is pretty high, right? I mean, a billion dollars. So the question is, I want to estimate how many people actually bought, you know, or how many tickets were sold. 
because you know one person can buy like 20 tickets so I, just, I can only estimate how many tickets were sold so how can we do that okay so let me show you the entire table because the first few entries were not particularly useful but what about these rows here what do they mean okay so what what do you guys think so we'll focus on one particular row. Let's say this one, two plus Powerball. What does that mean? So they match two out of the five numbers and the Powerball also matches. Okay, very good. So what about just three? What does that mean? Three out of five match and then the Powerball did not match, right? Okay. So we have statistics here. We know that there are one thousand uh, thirteen thousand four hundred and one people who ended up having seven dollars as a prize money because they matched three out of the five numbers. So I'm going to use that as a clue so that I can estimate how many tickets were actually sold. Is that okay? So the first thing I need to know is how many tickets will win this particular prize? In other words, out of the close to 300 million possible tickets, how many tickets will match exactly three out of the five numbers, but not the Powerball number? I want to find that number first, because now I, can, I have the ratio. I can use the ratio to, in, to basically work out how many tickets were actually sold. All right. so. Let's go ahead and find out you know, how to work this out. The best way to find this out is to use Google Sheet. Because in Google Sheet, I can create it in the folder that you already have access to. Okay, so that's one thing that's nice about that. Okay, so I go to my drive, go to CISP 440, go to shared. And I'll just create a spreadsheet with today's date. Okay, that makes it easy for you to find. If you know what day we talk about this, you can find the spreadsheet. And I'll name the spreadsheet with today's date. So that's super easy. So 2014-0403, that's today's date. There you go. So if you have your own computer or if you use the lab, the desktop in front of you, you can actually get to it right now. <clears throat> All right, so we are, I'm going to write the prompt here. So we are looking at, you know, matching oops, three of the five lucky numbers, not the Powerball number. Okay, so I don't, I want to mention this, you know, so that we have a context of what is the, cal the rest of the calculation. So the thing we want to do is to say, okay, let's just focus on, uh, finding those, you know, finding num the number of ways so that we end up with three numbers that are matching out of the five. First of all, we think about experiments, trials, with or re uh, without replacements. We have to start to think in those terms. First of all, is it with or without replacement? So the way you think about this problem is you have those five winning numbers in a bag already, okay? And what you need to think about is if I were to draw three balls out of the bag, how many ways can I do that? So the first question is, is ordering important? Let's just say that one, two, three, four, five are the winning numbers, okay? Is the ordering important? Did I draw those balls out as one, two, three, Two three one or three two one does that matter? It does not matter. Okay, so we are dealing with combinations. Okay, um, is it with or without replacement? Can I you know draw the balls in, in like one 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 after I get the ball out of the bag, I put it back and then draw it again, or do I just draw the ball out of the bag and set it aside? We set it aside, so it is without replacement. Okay. So from those two, we are looking at combinations, okay? So most people will look at this and go like, oh, that's pretty easy. We have five to begin with, and we are choosing three. Ordering is not important, so we're dealing with combinations and not permutations. So we got 10 ways to do this. In other words, out of the five winning numbers, there are just 10 ways 
to pick three out of the five winning numbers. You go like, well, in that case, you know, I cannot imagine that so many people would get that particular prize money, which is seven. Okay, so this is just one. Okay, this is basically the number of ways to choose five, three of the five winning numbers. Oop, winning numbers. Okay. So remember, each ticket has how many numbers, not counting the Powerball? It has five. So we have figured out how to pick three of the five slots. There are two slots left, right? So how do we figure out the number of ways to pick, to fill up those two additional slots? In other words, what we're trying to figure out is the number of ways to choose two of the remaining non-winning numbers. So I'm going to say non-winning numbers. How many non-winning numbers are we talking about? So the, the numbers are from 1 to 69, okay? And five of those are winning numbers. So how many are non-winning numbers? There are 64 non-winning numbers. And out of those 64 non-winning numbers, I need two of those, right? Is that okay? I mean, first of all, you know, does everybody understand why I'm doing this? Because what's happening is out of the 69 balls, okay, five are winning numbers, I put those in one bag. The remaining 64, I put those in a different bag. Out of the winning number bag, I say, okay, I need to figure out how many ways to choose to get three of those, three out of the five, okay? And we figure out, oh, there's only 10, okay, cool. And then out of the 64 non-winning numbers, I need to pick two of those in order to make up a ticket. So the number of ways to choose the non-winning numbers is actually just as important as the ways to choose the winning numbers. But the way it is computed is basically the same way. It's using combination because it really is the same nature. It has the same nature as the other one, except these are the quote unquote non-winning numbers and we just need two of them, right? So it becomes your know, combin 64, two. Okay, so now we got two numbers. Okay, one is 10, the other one is 2016. The question is, how do I combine these? In other words, not counting the Powerball, okay? How many ways can I choose three out of the five winning numbers and two of the 64 non-winning numbers? Am I adding, am I multiplying, or am I using exponent? Multiplying, very good, okay. Why are we multiplying? Remember the tree concept thing? Yep, go ahead. because the way you think about it is how you say it. For each way of choosing three out of five of the winning numbers, there are 2,016 ways to choose the non-winning numbers, okay? So the word for each is associated with multiplication. Are we good so far? Okay, so we are multiplying these, okay? So we are gonna, so I'm gonna work on this step by step, okay? So I'm just gonna multiply these two together there are 20,160 ways. Okay, this is the number of ways to choose three uh, winning numbers, okay? Generally speaking, okay? So that implies you know, the other two are non-winning. Are we good so far? Yeah, that doesn't look like a very big number, you know, 20,000 something, but we are forgetting the Powerball number, right? And in this case, we want to not match the Powerball number. So do, does anyone remember the number of, what is the range of the Powerball number? It's from one to 26, that is correct. So how many ways can we choose a not matching Powerball number? 25, very good, okay. So we have 25 and I'm gonna comment the number of, uh, 
Powerball numbers that do not match the winning ticket. There we go. Okay. So what do we do between these two? Multiply again. Very good. So we multiply these two, which is, and this is why I like to use a spreadsheet because you know, there's no copy and paste. It minimizes your know, end user error, right? So there are five, about half a million, okay? There are about a half a million ways to get a ticket that matches three out of the f three out of five winning numbers, but it doesn't match the Powerball number. Is that okay? So now we have this as the number of tickets that match three of the five winning numbers and no match for the Powerball number. Okay, so how is this going to be helpful? Well, the way this is going to be helpful is we go back here and say, oh, for this particular drawing, okay, which is weekly, there are exactly 13,401 people winning $7, which is exactly what you get when your ticket has three out of the five winning numbers, but you're not matching the Powerball number. So how do we combine these two facts in order to give us an estimate? I can have to emphasize this is just an estimate, okay? But how do we combine these two facts in order to estimate the total number of tickets sold? It's a ratio thing. So, okay, first of all, which three numbers are we playing with, okay? So we have this number. Let me copy and paste it to the spreadsheet so this way we don't have to go back and forth you know, all the time. So now we have you know, this number, and this is the actual number of tickets that won seven bucks, which is what you get you know, for, um, okay. That may not be the best way to do, do it because you know, there may be other ways to win just exactly seven bucks. Nope, this is the only way. Okay, so that's unique, that's fine. All right, so we got this number, we got this number. What is missing in order to complete our calculation? The total number of possible tickets, right? Okay, so now we work that out, okay? We already know that answer, we worked it out already. So the total number of tickets here you know, would be um, 69, you'll choose five times you know, the 26 you know, Powerball numbers. So that number, that's the total number, okay? So I'm gonna write it down here. The total number of unique, you, you, unique uh, lotto tickets. All right. All right, so now we have all of these numbers, and I'm gonna say that you know, these three are what we need to estimate the total number of tickets actually sold this week. How do we work with these three numbers? Which one do we multiply? Which one do we divide? Are we gonna add? Are we gonna subtract? How do we formulate that? Well, let me rephrase the question. What are the chances, okay? Let's just say that you buy a single ticket. What are the chances that you get seven bucks back as a prize money? So how do we calculate that probability? The ratio between which two? Okay, very good. So it would be this number divided by this number, right? Okay, so we'll go ahead and calculate that first. So we have this divided by that, okay? So this is the probability to uh, win a $7 price, okay? All right, and this is not in percentage. You know, in percentage, it would be a 0.17%. And we know this many people actually got seven bucks, right? So how do we make use of this number and this number to estimate the total number of tickets sold. This is the expected ratio, right, between the total number of tickets sold and the total number of people who won seven bucks as a price. Is that okay? In other words, the unknown that we are dealing with, let's call it N, 
So that means 13,401 divided by n should be about 0 0.0017, blah, blah, blah. Is that okay? So using algebra, we can solve for n. How do we solve for n? You, well, division is needed in this case. Okay, so what you do is, yeah, go ahead. So you divide this number by the expected ratio. So this is the total number of tickets or an estimate of the total number of tickets sold. So this is, you know, we have to emphasize this is an estimate, okay, estimate of the total number of tickets sold. And that's not a very high number, by the way. That's uh, when 7.7 .7 million, let's call it 8 million. So they only sold 8 million tickets, which is not a lot. When the prize money is a billion dollars, a billion. <laughs> You're turning your head. Hmm? Yeah, yep. So, but uh, you guys look at seeing how we can apply these things. You know, you can you can do all kinds of stuff, right? Because you can also you can you can go forward and say, if I were to spend two dollars, you know, what am I expected to get? You know, as a result. So you can say, okay. So let me go back to that page, because you don't always want to aim for the jackpot. You know, the jackpot is, you know, a billion dollars. But the next one up is you know matching five of out of the five million numbers. Well, that gets you two million dollars of and change, right? And if you match four of the five winning numbers and a Powerball, you get fourteen thousand one hundred fifty-seven dollars. So that means you know if you were to spend two dollars, okay, you have to look at the probability of winning these all these prizes too, in order to get a sense of okay what can I expect you know as a return out of spending these two dollars. I believe this number is, um, these numbers are fixed. I'm not sure about this one. So certain numbers are fixed. So you can actually pre-calculate the return, and then the jackpot is the only one that is not um, set. Do we have any questions about this? So overall speaking, yeah, we only got two minutes left, but I'm just going to teach a little bit of philosophy here. So. <clears throat> Why do you think there's a lotto? What 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 do you think it's for? Okay, first question. Overall speaking, do you think lotto as a mechanism is making money or do you think it's losing money? Of course it's making money. It's just like going to the casino, right? You know, who's who's paying for the electricity? Who's paying for the drain? Who's paying for the carpet and the cleaning of the carpet? Okay, they have to be making money. Exactly. So the next question is, what is that money going to? Well, this is the state run lotto, right? Yeah, this is California lotto. So this is probably going back to the state and probably funding like infrastructure and stuff. That sort of thing. Yes. So it is actually part of my paycheck. <laughs> So lotto fund is actually going back into education, which is somewhat ironic, because if we get education done right, no one is going to buy lotto. <laughs> so the fact that lotto is still going and people are buying lotto is the fact is is a proof, okay, that you know the education system is not working the way it's supposed to. So this is rather ironic. But I'm teaching you guys this you know, anyway, you, even though you know, part of that money is going into my paycheck. <laughs> All right, so that's it for today. Um, over the weekend, please, please you know, study the material for exam two so that you know, on Monday, if you need any clarification on the concepts, if you want to, you know, if you make up a question and you cannot quite understand, okay, but I'm not sure about the answer. I can make up this kind of interesting question, but I know I don't know the answer. You can bring it on Monday or you know office hour on any day so that I can take a look at it and I'll give you the answer. Yes.
I also forgot to ask you about uh, the method of resolution that I used mm -hmm. uh, that we talked about on what was it, last Wednesday. Did okay. I show that to you right now? Um, let me stop the recorder okay. first. <laughs> because I'm fairly sure that does not need to be recorded. <laughs> 